All right, uh, might as well get underway. First off, hello everybody. My name is Velox Morris. I'm going to be teaching this class on strategic cruisers. So first off, make sure you're in the class.euni channel. Uh, and I want to make sure everybody please has their uh, push to talk button enabled so uh, you don't get any interruption during the course. Um, I'll be taking uh, questions all throughout. I'm going to try and answer them as they come in. So please ask your questions in class.euni. Uh, if I don't see it right away, please, uh, you know, just prod me or uh, uh, repost the question. And I'll uh, try and get to it. So first off, I want to uh, just be clear about it. I'm not an expert on every strategic cruiser out there. Uh, I personally fly Tengu and Loki, um, since, you know, those are the best ones. But uh, <laughs> I'm also going to try and uh, be as unbiased about the others uh, as best I can. Um, the Legion and Proteus... Well, at least the Legion definitely has some uh, viable uses for it. Uh, and hopefully the Proteus after this Crucible patch will be pretty decent too. Um, but realistically, uh, it always depends on the role. And all of them are going to be viable ships coming up. So uh, I'm going to start off the class by the definition. What is a strategic cruiser or a Tech 3 ship? Um, basically, it's a ship that was introduced kind of recently, at least uh, as far as EVE goes. Uh, and... They are what are considered modular ships. Uh, what that means is they are ships that not only have a hull component to them, but they also have different subsystems, which let you really customize what these ships are for you. So why would you know you want to go through that hassle of uh, you know flying a strategic cruiser? They uh, they have a lot of drawbacks to them, but uh, the benefits are they are extremely versatile. Uh, they are just insanely versatile because they are modular. Uh, you can't always see something like a Loki and know exactly how it's going to be fit because, quite frankly, there are just an uncalculatable number of combinations for this ship. Um, it's just astronomically high. So if you see a Loki or a Tengu or Proteus or Legion in space, you probably aren't going to be able to guess how they're fit. Uh, and that gives them a huge advantage. Uh, and even aside from that, they are very, very uh, good ships as far as uh, comparing the DPS, the tank, the uh, signature radius, their E-War component. Um, they're just very strong ships in addition. So um, they're definitely worthwhile to go for in that regard. So I mentioned the drawbacks real briefly. Uh, they have substantial drawbacks, first of which is the cost. Um, okay, people are computing the number of combinations, just to prove me wrong, but if you start looking at modules as well, it, it's uh, it's pretty difficult to tell how one of these things is going to be fit. <laughs> um, I probably should have uh, expected that, but um, there are a lot of different combinations for these ships. So back to the drawbacks. Um, the first one's the cost. They are very expensive, even just for the hull. Uh, to purchase, and then, uh, you know, you start adding in mods as well. A lot of people, uh, you know, really kind of go crazy with faction and dead space modules, too. Uh, and it really does drive the cost of these up. Um, excuse me. Uh, normally, uh, a strategic cruiser, you're going to be looking at at least uh, something in the vicinity of 500 million, uh, just as a, a rough estimation, um, at minimum. Uh, some of them easily go up over a billion isk uh, just to purchase uh, the hull modules and subsystems. I uh, should mention now that each strategic cruiser not only needs the hull, but also needs all five different subsystems um, of the specific type. I'll get into those a little bit later, but uh, you aren't going to be able to fly one of these without all five of them in the ship. So another uh, drawback is the skill trees for these are sort of a dead end skill tree. Uh, once you train these, they aren't a prerequisite for anything and uh, they really don't benefit anything other than the strategic cruiser you train for. So um, if you're not using these strategic cruisers, uh, they're not going to be, uh, you're not going to be putting those skill points to use. So that's uh, another thing just to be kind of wary about. It's not a huge drawback, but they do take a little bit of training if you want to get everything uh, maxed out to level 5 with them. Uh, Tark and Shaloon said, uh, asks a question here. Can they, the subsystems be swapped, or are they like rigs? They can be swapped. Um, I think there are still issues with them being swapped in wormhole space, but at a station they can be swapped just fine. Uh, you don't have to redo your rigs or anything. They can be swapped and you can still retain the rigs you have. 
Um, but I think there were issues with that in wormhole space if you're uh, or at a POS in general if you're refitting at a POS. So uh, just be aware of that too. You can use a maintenance bay. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Tart. Maintenance bay? Oh, you mean uh, at a POS? No, uh, I don't believe you can right now. Yeah, or uh, at an orca or uh, a carrier. I don't think it works like that at the moment. Um, there have been some. I guess it's more rants uh, asking CCP to change that, but at the moment I don't think it's possible. So the last major drawback of flying a strategic cruiser is if you get blown up in it, you're in trouble because uh, you have a skill loss upon death. And what that means, uh, you'll actually get a warning for it the first time you jump into one of these strategic cruisers, is that if you get blown up while you're in a strategic cruiser, um, whichever subsystem skill is highest, uh, you have one skill for each of your five subsystems, whichever one's highest is going to be knocked down by an entire level. So you're going to lose all those skill points and you'll have to retrain it to uh, get it back to where it was. Kaylin asks, what is a subsystem? Sorry, I probably should have defined that a little bit better. Um, a subsystem is one of the five modules that you could put into the strategic cruiser. Um, each of the strategic cruisers has five different types of subsystems, and each of those five different types of subsystems has four different options for uh, which one you want to use. Uh, and with all of those different options, it lets you really customize what your strategic cruiser becomes at the end. Um, just an, ex an example, uh, some strategic cruisers end up being fleet boosters, kind of like command ships. Some of them end up being logistic ships. Um, some of them end up being PvP ships or PvE ships. Uh, they are just extremely, extremely versatile. Um, I've been known to use mine as a scout ship, my Loki especially. Um, and I have even seen a Legion be used as a salvager before. This was before Noctus was out there, but uh, it was a very effective salvager. Kind of an odd use for it, but... Um, so, uh, back to the subsystems real quick. You have the five different subsystems for each ship, and these are going to be different depending on which strategic cruiser you fly. Um, that is to say, uh, the subsystems for the Tengu aren't going to be the same subsystems as the Loki has. Uh, and so on and so forth. Some of them do have similar subsystems or even the same subsystems in some instances, but it's definitely not all of the time that they're the same. Um, Leonidas asks, I'm training Vulture right now. Can a T3 operate better than this ship? Um, as far as a fleet booster goes, it technically can get better numbers. It can uh, boost a little bit better than a typical command ship can. The problem is the command ship is going to let you use three uh, fleet uh, booster modules, whereas the strategic cruiser only lets you use one by default. You can use command processors to get that up to three as well, um, but you're not going to be very useful in combat if you do that, so uh, it's a little bit trickier to fit it out, uh, but all in all, yes, it can be a more effective fleet booster. So getting into the mores a little bit uh, more with uh, the different types of strategic cruisers, um, you'll see a lot of the same ships being used for the same roles. Uh, for example, uh, a Loki is a very good scout ship. Uh, it's very good at secure hauling. It can be a very nasty PvP ship, which uh, takes people off guard sometimes, because it's not typically known for that. Um, the Tengu is really, really good for PvE and PvP. The Legion, uh, you see a lot of the Legion doing PvE work in wormhole space. Uh, it takes advantage of not having uh, ammo requirement, so uh, it's a good place to use the Legion. And the Proteus is um, at least currently uh, best known as a PvP ship. Uh, so those are the typical roles, but uh, given the erratic and modular nature of these ships, you can see basically any of the strategic cruisers used in any role. So. Uh, it's very easy to be taken off guard. Keep that in mind if you ever uh, intend to in engage a, a strategic cruiser. Inara Shai asks, I know there is no best in EVE, but your preference to Loki, is that due to preference to projectiles? Um, yeah, kind of. I, uh, I started as a Mimitar pilot, so uh, that was sort of a, uh, a good place to jump into for strategic cruisers. The Loki, uh, a lot of people you know, argue whether it's... Uh, uh, as useful as the other strategic cruisers, but personally, I uh, I do like the Loki. It is uh, a very good ship, um, and 
numbers wise, uh, it actually does very similarly to the other strategic cruisers in PvP. Um, it can be very, very fast. It can have a massive armor tank if you're uh, in an armor fleet. Uh, it's, a, it's a strong ship, really. Sarah Schneider asks a wonderful question here. Uh, I, I'm trying my best not to laugh at this, but uh, how do you use Proteus for PvP? Um, honestly, at the moment, I don't. But uh, a lot of people have put together pretty good Proteus fits uh, for PvP. Um, there is an Ewar subsystem that uh, gives it a similar bonus as, uh, say, the Arazu. Um, it's a long point bonus, um, and with a scram, I think you can get something like 20 some odd kilometers on a scram. And since blasters are close range uh, DPS, having that long scram and uh, maybe a web, like a Fen Navy web or something, um, lets you get in really close range with people and just deal out a lot of DPS really easily. Sarah follows up saying, uh, so basically a very expensive interceptor, kind of, not really. Um, if you look at the uh, Arazu, for instance, uh, it just has such an amazingly long range on the point um, that it, it's not so much a fast ship, uh, it doesn't need to really get in range, it just sits somewhere on grid and it can point just about anywhere. Uh, so that's sort of the same idea um, with the Proteus. The Proteus typically, uh, the typical PvP fit Proteus, I should say, uh, is kind of uh, just uh, almost like you would fly a Brutix. You just get in somebody's face and uh, scram them, web them, and try and just do ludicrous amounts of DPS as fast as possible. So that's that's the Proteus, at least. I'm going to get into the differences between the different strategic cruisers real quick here. Um, they're very, very different uh, in how they're typically used, so it's good to know the differences, and uh, especially if you're uh, going to be training up to the strategic cruisers, uh, you're going to want to know what you're going to want, uh, what which race you're going to want to fly. Uh, there's more uh, banter about the Proteus not being as useful, let's say, uh, than the others, but I think with the upcoming uh, buff in Crucible to the, <coughs> to the hybrid weapons, I think it's actually going to be a very decent PvP ship, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see more of them coming out. Anyways, that said, let's start off with the Tengu. Uh, the Tengu is the Kaldari Strategic Cruiser. Um, its major pros are it's extremely good at PvE. Uh, it's sort of uh, unanimously uh, voted the best at PvE. I don't think any of the others really contend, um, except maybe the Legion and Wormhole Space, but... Uh, even then, uh, the Tengu is capable of very, very massive tank, as well as doing a lot of damage. Uh, and it's a missile boat, so you don't have to worry about you know, tracking and all of that. Um, it's a decent PvP ship, too. Uh, I know there are some fleet doctrines in Nullsec that uh, are based around using a bunch of Tengus, and it's kind of scary, actually, to go up against them. Um, they have very good range uh, if using heavy... Uh, heavy missile launchers. Uh, you can get massive range out of them. They do very good damage, have strong tank. They're just an all-around very solid strategic cruiser in that regard. Uh, the cons to it are it's dependent on ammo, uh, which is pretty typical. It's kind of predictable because there are so many uh, people that fly Tengus. Uh, a lot of people have kind of settled into similar fits, so it's probably the most predictable of the strategic cruisers, but um, it's still somewhat unpredictable. That makes any sense. Um, the other major con is it's very, very dependent on cap in most situations. Uh, most Tengus out there rely on cap religiously, and without cap, uh, their tank usually dies pretty quickly. So that's a good thing to keep in mind if you're ever going to engage a Tengu. Ah, that's another good uh, con I didn't think of. Thank you, Sarah, is they almost always do kinetic damage. I believe if uh, the Tengu is using the Covert subsystem, uh, they aren't tied to that though. I think it's only if they're uh, they're solid PvP fit uh, they're, or PvE fit they're going to be doing kinetic damage. Uh, Kalen asks, can you fit different size of missile launchers? Uh, not really. Um, the Tengu, you know, or actually all of them kind of stick to their uh, their medium or their typical cruiser sized weapons. Um, you could still swap between close range and long range weapons with each of them. Uh, for example, talking about the Tengu, you can go to heavy assault missile launchers or heavy missile launchers. Either works, really. That's the only question there. Dan asks, may I ask what a Kaldari ship is? I can't tell if you're trolling. 
I'm just going to uh, leave that one for now. Let's move on to the Loki. Loki is the Minmatar strategic cruiser. <clears throat> it is extremely versatile. Uh, I don't recall seeing many Loki fits that are similar to one another. Um, usually if you see a Loki, you can almost rest assured that you're never ever going to be able to guess what it's fit like. Uh, the best bet is if you look at uh, what the ship looks like, you might be able to guess the subsystems and kind of piece it out from there. But um, Loki's tend to be the most sporadically fit. So uh, you're not going to have a very good chance of guessing what it's fit like in PvP, PV, whatever. Uh, it tends to be very, very quick. It's probably the fastest of the strategic cruisers in most fittings. Um, and it has very little dependence on cap. Uh, which is kind of unique to the Loki, whereas all the others do rely on cap for something. Its cons are it tends to go through a lot of ammo. Um, it's kind of a jack-of-all-trades, but not really a superb, stellar, top-notch ship at any one specific thing. Um, I mean, maybe scouting. I like using my Loki for scouting uh, and stuff like that. It is very good at that, but yeah, it's not really... Uh, if you're looking for one specific thing for your strategic cruiser to do, it's not really the ship for that. Moving on to the Proteus, like I said, it's one big pro is it's good for PvP. Uh, PvP fit Proteus is a force to be reckoned with, and uh, if you don't believe me, I dare you guys to go out to low sec, find a Proteus, and engage it one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to die. Just saying. Um, the cons are, it is cap dependent for the blasters, um, a lot of the subsystems it has aren't really all that practical, so it's kind of standardized into a few roles, uh, really. One role, really. <laughs> it's slow because it's an armor tank, which kind of hurts the fact that, you know, it's supposed to be a in-your-face sort of ship. That's more of a uh, something inherent to Galente, though, but it happens. Uh, and it does use a lot of ammo, so... It does have that one rule where it's very good at PvP, and after the blaster buff it might be better at other things, but for the moment, if you see a Proteus, there's a pretty safe bet that's a PvP fit ship. And moving on to the Legion. Um, Legion is also sort of a, an odd ship. Uh, there are some cool fits with it, but uh, you know, it's, it's one of the T3s they don't see as often. Um, the big pro that it has is the lasers aren't ammo dependent, so... Uh, if you're living in W space, wormhole space, uh, it's a great ship to have because you know you aren't always sure if you're going to have ammo ready or be able to get ammo into your wormhole. So having a legion uh, just kind of kills that concern altogether, which is pretty cool. Um, it's an unpredictable ship like the other T3s. Uh, you know, most legions are fit kind of oddly compared to you know one another. Um, not a lot of them are similar to each other. Uh, and it's pretty good at both PvP and PvE. Um, the big cons are it's slow. I mean, it's an armor tank ship, and that's kind of inherent to an armor tank ship is it's going to be slow. Or I should say it's an armor tank ship in almost all fittings I could think of. Um, I don't think there's a subsystem that really helps out shield, but you know, if you really wanted to fit it shield tank, I'm sure you could find a way. Uh, the other thing that uh, makes it a big con for it is it is cap dependent for the turrets. So... Once again, if you want to kill a legion, nude it. So those are the four different uh, strategic cruisers. Uh, the big thing that you want to look at if you're going to be getting into one of these strategic cruisers is the skills. Uh, I'm going to go into those real quick right now. The way uh, the skills work for a strategic cruiser is you have one skill specific to each of the subsystem types. Uh, that is to say there's a defensive subsystem, an offensive subsystem, uh, engineering subsystem, an electronic subsystem, and a propulsion subsystem. So those are the five subs subsystems, and uh, you're going to have a skill specific to each one of those in your race. So these aren't all uh, broad between the races. These are specific to your race. So if I want to fly a Tengu, I'm going to need the Kaldari Offensive, Kaldari Defensive, Kaldari Electronic, Kaldari Engineering, Kaldari Propulsion. And each of those subsystems, excuse me, each of those skills independently are going to determine how effective the correlating subsystem is. So as Hofstadter uh, linked in 
class.ini, there's the Caldari offensive subsystem. If we click on that, uh, it doesn't really show it there. I'll have to link one of the subsystems specifically, but um, that skill is one of the five skills necessary to fly, one of the six, I should say, skills necessary to fly a Tengu. And then there's also the ship skill specifically. It would be Caldari strategic cruiser for the Tengu, for example. Thanks, Nuclear Llama. He just linked the Tengu Offensive Accelerated Ejection Bay, which is one of the offensive subsystems for the Tengu. And if we click on that and go to the description, you'll see that the subsystem skill bonus gives it 5% bon uh, bonus to kinetic missile damage, 7.5% bonus to heavy or heavy assault or assault missile launcher rate of fire, and 10% bonus to heavy missile, heavy assault missile velocity per level. So if I have this skill at 5, it's going to be giving me a big bonus. And by this skill, I mean the Caldari offensive subsystems for the accelerated ejection bay. It's going to be giving me a big bonus to all of those. And that's just with this one subsystem. You look at a normal ship, uh, like a normal cruiser, and it gets maybe uh, two bonuses to it. Uh, whereas the strategic cruisers are getting something like two or three bonuses per subsystem. Multiply that by five subsystems, you can see how these ships can become very, very strong very quickly. Kaylin Hearn asks, how long approximately does it take to train a subsystem up to five? Uh, they're only uh, tier, or, uh, yeah, tier one uh, skills, so they actually train rather quickly. Um, they're probably the, they're the easiest skills to train to five. Um, but... Like I said, there are going to be uh, five of them to train, plus the sixth for the ship itself. So now that you guys know how the subsystems work, with uh, skill directly correlating to each type of subsystem, there's also the ship skill, which uh, let's link uh, one of them here. So I linked the Kaldari Strategic Cruiser skill. This is before the Tengu, and uh, it doesn't show it if you click on it, but um, the, what this skill does for your Tengu, if you are flying a Tengu, is... Each level of it is going to give a 5% bonus to, I believe, nanite or uh, heat absorption. So if you're overheating modules and you have uh, the Caldari Strategic Cruiser uh, trained up to, say, 5 on your Tengu, it will be able to absorb uh, a lot more uh, heat damage on its modules. So if you're interested in PvPing in a Strategic Cruiser, also be wary that you're going to want to train up the uh, strategic cruiser skill itself in addition to the subsystems. If you're using it for PvP or scouting or something like that, where you're not going to be in uh, direct combat, where you think you're going to be overheating, um, you can pretty much just train that skill to one and leave it at one, but it is required to sit in the actual hull itself. So I'm going to go into uh, a little more detail about each of the subsystem types. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, the electronic subsystem. Uh, what this subsystem does is it dictates mostly your CPU, your targeting range, scan resolution, and your sensor strength. So uh, it's uh, each of the four different options that you're going to have are going to give you different values for each of those fields. So different CPU, targeting range, scan resolution, or sensor strength. So when you're trying to build out uh, Tengu, you're going to want to play around. Uh, like EFT is absolutely the most valuable tool if you want to sit in a strategic cruiser with um, trying to fit different uh, subsystems and modules so you can get to where you want to be with uh, whatever you're using your strategic cruiser for. Um, the other big thing with the electronic subsystem um, is there is an EWAR-related subsystem that... Uh, kind of gives your strategic cruiser a similar bonus to uh, what the uh, electronic attack frigates or uh, recons have for your race. So, for example, the Legion has a subsystem called the Energy Parasitic Complex uh, that gives it a similar bonus to what the Curse has. Uh, it's not quite as good as the Curse, but um, it, it's actually probably one of the best fits for Legion uh, is using that subsystem. Uh, additionally, the Loki has immobility drivers, which give it a bonus to uh, webs, kind of like the rapier. Uh, that's web range. Uh, and then the Proteus has friction extension processors, which increase its scram or uh, point range. And the Tengu has an obfuscation manifold, which gives it a bonus to ECM. So the Tengu can also be fit for ECM. Uh, and 
This is one of the electronic subsystems for each of the races, and it can make them very, very dangerous in uh, PvP uh, just because of that. Now, moving on to the defensive subsystem. Uh, normally, this is going to be the subsystem that dictates your resists, your effect pit points, um, your cargo space, and your signature radius. <coughs> um, Usually this is going to be the one that's going to give you your defensive bonuses. Uh, normally uh, each race is going to have uh, a subsystem that's mostly for passive tanking or buffer tanking uh, and a subsystem for active tanking. Um, then there's also one uh, specifically for the defensive subsystem called the Warfare Processor. Each race has this uh, and this is going to be the subsystem you use if you want to use your strategic cruiser as a command ship. It gives a massive bonus to using uh, uh, warfare uh, links in <clears throat> in fights. So if you're going to be using uh, or fitting out for a command ship style strategic cruiser, remember that you're going to have to use your warfare processor uh, subsystem as your defensive subsystem. Moving on to the offensive, uh, the offensive subsystem dictates how many hard points you have. Uh, if you're going to be able to use drones, uh, most of them don't have drone bays, but uh, some of them do. And it gives uh, your weapon bonuses, and there's also a special subsystem for offensive called the Covert Reconfiguration Subsystem. This lets you use a Covert Ops cloaking device on your strategic cruiser. Uh, normally, if you're using a Covert Ops cloaking device, though, uh, the weapon bonuses are considerably less, so you're not going to be able to do as much damage or be as effective in PvP. Um, at least as far as uh, dealing damage goes, but uh, that's the trade-off for being able to use your covered ops cloak. The engineering sus subsystem is what dictates your capacitor and power grid, uh, so it's very important for fitting, uh, especially if you're uh, trying to do a PvE fit, is choosing the right engineering subsystem. Uh, one of the specific, <coughs> uh, or the special subsystem for engineering is the supplemental coolant injector. Every race has one of these for their engineering subsystem, and uh, what that does is it lets your strategic cruiser absorb even more uh, heat on the modules, in addition to the hulls skill that also does that. So if you're using uh, the supplemental coolant injector subsystem and you have your hull skill trained up to five, um, you can overheat like crazy in these things. So they could be very, very nasty in PvP if uh, somebody overheats well. And the last subsystem is the propulsion subsystem. Uh, this is one that I particularly love because the special subsystem that all races have in common for propulsion is the interdiction nullifier. Uh, what the interdiction nullifier does is it lets you warp through uh, warp disruption bubbles, uh, which are uh, deployed by uh, either an anchored module, a uh, something like that. Thank you, a uh, an anchor module, an interdictor, or a heavy interdictor. And it's it's a very good thing to have in Null, uh, as Seiko points out. Uh, you know, bubbles you're only going to see in Null sec or in wormhole space, so uh, keep that in mind if you ever plan on heading out there, uh, that this is a huge bonus. Uh, it lets you warp through bubbles, and also it uh, lets you not get dragged by a drag bubble. In coupling this subsystem with the covert reconfiguration, uh, as Silex pointed out, makes it a very, very effective scout in Nullsec or uh, Wormhole space because not only can you cloak, but you can also warp through bubbles. So um, it makes it extremely, extremely versatile as a scout. The other uh, properties for the other propulsion subsystems, though, are going to dictate your velocity and agility. Um, they tend to have uh, one subsystem that gives you a bonus for your afterburner speed, and uh, all of the others are pretty different. Sarah asks, does that make it impossible to catch T3 if fit specifically for a runner? Uh, I wouldn't say impossible. It's very, very difficult, though. Um, considering that he has a covert ops cloak, and he can't be, uh, is or he is uh, immune to the effects of bubbles, you basically have to get points on him, and uh, if he has warp core stabs as well, I mean, you need to have... It's pretty much impossible, yeah. Um, that said, it it's possible, but it's difficult. Um, like, even recently, I was uh, flying around in a Loki, and I 
jumped into a gate camp and uh i was kind of not paying attention and i just said screw it you know i'm just gonna warp away and uh what basically happened was uh i couldn't cloak because uh somebody was too close to me after i decloaked tried to warp away something i probably should have caught if i was paying better attention but uh i wasn't so uh you know i could have easily been tackled there uh, i don't fly with warp cross stabs or anything but uh i wasn't you know i just aligned very quickly and warped away before they could tackle me but uh you know so it's possible it's just improbable um salix is asking can i hit with focus point script do it sure um if you know you can actually target the the strategic cruiser in time that would tackle it just fine um one thing i should note about the interdiction nullifier subsystem it doesn't actually give you increased warp strength at all so an interceptor uh, with a point could still lock it down if he manages to target it. Sarah asks, some people say to never fit warp core stabs to T3s, fit nanos, or anything to boost a line. Is this true? Uh, it's a matter of preference, really. Uh, I personally would tend to agree with that. I would rather fit nanos instead of warp core stabs. But, uh, you know, like I said, it's a matter of preference. Uh, Honestly, uh, like I, I fly a Loki, it already aligns pretty quickly. Adding nanos to it, uh, you know, it's just very, very difficult to tackle even without using the covered ops uh, cloak. So, so a few tips, just random tips that I thought of. Um, EFT is invaluable. If you're thinking about getting into a strategic cruiser, start playing around with EFT now. Um, just play around with the different subsystems, the different modules, and just keep constantly making different fits for it until you find something that you absolutely love. Uh, offhand, you know, some of these strategic cruisers aren't very good in certain roles, uh, so you're going to have to be aware of what strategic cruiser you fly, uh, you know, the weaknesses and strengths of it, and kind of play to do that. Um, for example, if you want to, you know, use your strategic cruiser for PvE, you're probably not going to want to use a Proteus. Um, you know, though Loki and Legion do okay at it, and Tengu is just superb at PvE. So you're going to want to uh, take that into account. You know, if you're traditionally a Galente pilot and you want a strategic cruiser, I'm not going to say that you can't use a Proteus for PvE. It's just not great at it, at least right now. Um, so things like that, if you're really, really solid about uh, you know which strategic cruiser you want to use, Bear in mind that uh, the one role that you choose for it today might not be the same role you're going to be using it for, you know, a year from now. So uh, just try and consider that versatility. Um, some good places to get fittings for strategic cruisers are uh, check things like uh, Battle Clinic uh, kill boards. I absolutely love finding fittings on kill boards. Um, yeah, it's a bad thing that, you know, if it's on a kill board it died, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad fitting. Uh, I've found some very, very good fittings from uh, even uh, strategic cruisers have killed myself. Uh, you know, I've seen something they did and just thought, wow, that's a great idea. I'm going to use that. So uh, just keep checking out kill boards like crazy, playing around with EFT, and uh, you can get a very solid fit that you like. Sarah asks a uh, random question. What are some other uses for the Legion besides incursions? Like I said, I mean, I've seen a Legion be used for, uh, you know, salvaging which uh, probably isn't the best use for it, but it worked. Uh, you know, all of the strategic cruisers can make uh, very, very good uh, uh, scout ships or secure haulers since they have the interdiction nullifier subsystem as well as covert ops cloak. Um, and also you can uh, play around, you get different uh, module slots depending on which subsystems you use. So you try and max out your low slots and fit a lot of nanos or uh, eye stabs just to uh, make it align very, very quickly. Um, let's see, Legion, what else can you do? Uh, yeah, the Newt Boat, uh, using the electronics uh, subsystem, the energy parasitic complex, uh, makes it very, very dangerous as kind of a, a better version of a, uh, not a curse, a pilgrim, uh, the covert ops subsystem with it, and it's it's a pretty nasty ship like that. Um, if you're into more of the canid, style Amara ships. Uh, it can make a decent uh, missile boat too. Uh, that usually takes people off guard because most people see a legion and they think it's going to be a laser boat. But um, once they start seeing missiles, you know, it can really, really surprise people with that. End up being very good, but you know, the surprise factor could 
make up that difference. Um, Sarah asks, uh, so you're saying the Legion is practically useless compared to others? No, not at all. Um, it can be a very nasty PvP ship. Uh, I myself wouldn't mind flying a Legion, but uh, you look at something like the Tengu, the Tengu is kind of the king of PvE. Uh, you know, I, I can't really argue with that. Uh, it's just so useful in that role. Um, I definitely wouldn't say it's useless, but yeah, it might not be as good as some of the other T3s in some roles. Uh, it's all about roles with the T3s. Uh, some T3s are very good in certain situations, others not so much. Like I said, with the Legion, uh, if you're in wormhole space, they are invaluable. They are per like the best ships you could have. Alistair Creston asks, how about exploration? Which T3 would you prefer? Um, they actually all are kind of good for it. Uh, there's a subsystem called the Emergent Locust Analyzer. Uh, I think that's the electronic subsystem, uh, and that gives them a huge bonus to probe strength, so uh, they kind of work as a covert ops uh, as far as probe strength goes in that regard. Um, if you're trying to do everything in one ship, it's saying using the Emergent Locust Analyzer uh, so you can probe out places and go in and uh, you know, run sites or whatever with the exact same ship, I would actually say the Loki is extremely good for that, and uh, my reasoning is, uh, oh, excuse me, Chinese food's killing me. Um, the uh, the speed is probably going to be one of your biggest allies. Uh, the Loki can armor tank, which would free up the medium slots for, say, your analyzers or code breakers or whatever else you want to do. Uh, the Proteus could actually pretty be pretty good with that because you could free up the high slots using the drone subsystem, which doesn't do a lot of DPS, but... Uh, those high slots could be used as a uh, salvager, so you can also salvage and loot your stuff pretty easily while dealing damage and uh, probing stuff down. Um, realistically, any of them can be very good exploration ships. Uh, with the amount of subsystems and options you have, uh, it's pretty easy to configure it specifically for exploration, and uh, any of them could really fill the role. But I think uh, if I was going to fit one out specifically for exploration, I would do a Loki personally. And uh, the last major tip I have for you guys is the golden rule of Eve. Do not fly what you can't afford to lose. Uh, how many times do you see uh, you know, these strategic cruisers on killboards with ridiculous fittings costing, you know, one and a half, two billion isk? Um, just keep that in mind that, you know, these are very, very good ships. If flown correctly, they're very difficult to kill. But they do still die. Uh, so, you know, bear that in mind. Don't put too much into one ship. Um, but, you know, they, they they are very durable if you fly them right. So, Seikal asks, so if one can afford a 400 mil T3, would that be a bad idea? No, uh, I actually, uh, I prefer using a very, very cheap PvE Tengu. Uh, even though that's one of the roles where you could probably, you know, throw some faction stuff in it. But... Realistically, you don't need faction to get by with it. Um, let me uh, link this real quick, actually. Actually, I don't have much room for that, but um, the uh, the PVE Tango I use uh, costs under 700 million total, which you know it's kind of cheap. Uh, you know, most T3s you're working around 500 million base for just a standard T2 fit, uh, maybe 400 million. So 700 isn't that much more. Um, it's just a couple of faction modules. I use a faction afterburner and a faction shield booster. Other than that, it's all tech two, and uh, I've run ten of ten complexes and null with it uh, just fine. So, you know, it, it's uh, it really depends on you know what you want to invest in it, what you want out of it. I've seen people that uh, have flown Loki's for PvP that they've dumped you know one and a half billion into and then lost to a doomsday or something in a fleet and you know it absolutely kills them but you know they kind of had it coming it could have been a very solid ship with just t2 fittings sarah asks uh do i have a rule of thumb for fitting t3s as in don't go over more than x isk uh not specifically uh for the most part uh i prefer using t3s in non-combat roles just because uh i hate retraining skills but um even in my pvp uh loki i greatly uh prefer just using tech 2 mods uh that's personal preference i could probably up it a little bit uh you know like imperial maybe uh eanms or something uh it'll give it more effective hit points better resist that sort of thing but 
you know, realistically, it's not that much of a benefit from the Tech 2 module. So uh, I just don't see the point in adding the ISK to it. I can afford it just fine. I just don't really see the point to it. Kaelin asks, what is the approximate value of a T3L in all 20 subsystems? Holy smokes. Um, I honestly would say you are never going to want to buy all 20 subsystems for a hull. Uh, that is just because some of them are absolutely useless. Uh, you know, some of them are just horrible and you're never going to want to use them. Uh, another thing is uh, the roles change so much that a lot of the times you're going to have to change your rigs for the role. So, for example, a PVE uh, role might have capacitor control circuits where PVP might have like field extenders or trimarks. Um, so you're not going to want to change a specific hull around that much. Uh, that said, you know, just like a base, uh, base hull in the, like, uh, the five subsystems, you're probably looking at around 400 million without mods. So bear that in mind. I wanted to switch the rigs on my Tango, so I got another HAR, but I can't get the subsystems out of my first one. Is there a trick to do it? Without removing the rigs? Uh, not really. I mean, you, you'd have to replace any subsystem you want to remove because each strategic cruiser, once it's assembled, has to always have five subsystems in it, one of each type. So what you could do um, is just buy one really, really cheap subsystem in the type you're trying to remove, put that or swap that into the Tengu that you're trying to get the, mod, the subsystem out of, and then take that subsystem and put it in your other one. Uh, that's probably the best way to go about it. Or you can repackage it, but you'll lose any rigs on it. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, I thought maybe uh, I get a warning message that my rigs would be removed, but um, the subsystems would drop out before that or something like that. Nope, it all happens at the same time. But um, it actually sucks to, <laughs> to use two dangles because you would then have to get three times the subsystems to switch them around. Oh yeah, I know it. Um, I typically do keep uh, more than one of a strategic cruiser around. But uh, yeah, you know, having spare subsystems is good for that purpose. Uh, Nightmare asks here, uh, I don't want to fly a Tengu for level 4 missions. What's my next best option? I'm mostly trained in hybrid turrets. Um, honestly, I think the Proteus is going to be a very decent uh, PvE ship after Crucible hits, uh, the blasters are getting a buff, it might actually be a very viable option. Um, I know uh, there's a EVE University graduate named Braku who uh, rocks a PvE Proteus right now, and uh, I'm sure if you could find him, uh, let me link his name actually, you probably send him an email, he's a nice guy, he'll help you out with it, uh, maybe show you some fittings. Um, it can work, I mean it works today, but um, it's just not the ideal or the normal that people do with the Proteus. Yeah, as some people point out the Proteus isn't getting a speed boost. Uh, they're still changing things around, so that might change, but um, it is getting the blaster buff. So, you know, it's something. And it it functions as a PvE ship today. It might not be the best one out there, but uh, it's fully possible to use it. Uh, honestly, I mean, I also play Galente a little bit. Um, I love using an Ishtar for PvE if that doesn't work for you, so keep that option in mind too. I'm kind of backing up on questions here. Uh, sorry if I haven't gotten to your, all of yours yet. Hang on just a second. Nara Shai asks, someone said T3s get ganked very, very often. Is this true? Or also relative like everything else in EVE? It is very much relative. Um, I think T3s are kind of targeted because uh, not only do you normally see uh, faction or officer mods on them, but uh, you also get the delicious, sweet tears of blowing up somebody's strategic cruiser and making them retrain a skill. So, uh, as far as EVE goes, uh, that's very, very much uh, a positive reason for ganking a T3 ship. Uh, another reason they might be targeted a little bit more is a lot of them are so incredibly dependent on cap that uh, if you new a uh, strategic cruiser out, it's not going to take long to kill it. Uh, so, in that regard, they are ganked. You know, fairly often, but, um, you know, if you're smart about how you fly it, you should be pretty safe. You know, just be aware of your surroundings. Sarah Schneider asks about a Tengu fitting, and is it too expensive? Personally, I would say yes, um, but it's all up to you. Uh, 
like for example, the uh, the Calvary Navy and vulnerability fields are immensely expensive. Uh, I think that's worth about half of what my entire PVE Tengu is worth. Uh, a lot of people do like using the small shield boosters with the Tengu for PVE fits. Uh, that is definitely a good way to go. Uh, I think I see a lot of people use one Pithy and one uh, Scent B type uh, for the Tengu. Uh, so two small shield boosters and yeah, it gets you a pretty solid tank. So yeah, you might be able to drop the invulnerability field uh, and replace that, and that might significantly change the price. But uh, you know, that's just personal preference. If you have the ISK for it, what the hell? Why not? Let's see. Lady Elena asks, do you use any T2 rigs? Uh, not often. Um, sometimes I'll see something like a PvP Loki fit with uh, T2 Trimarks or a Proteus. Uh, you know, T2 Trimarks aren't that uncommon, but... Uh, realistically, it's a lot of ISK for a very, very small benefit. Uh, I think one reason people do use T2 rigs sometimes is they don't like the idea of uh, getting blown up and having their modules stolen. So, uh, you know, at least with the T2 rigs, they are always destroyed, and that you know gives you some sort of solace if you do happen to lose your T3. But uh, realistically, uh, I don't see use for the T2 rigs. That might change... Uh, you know, they're changing the Doomsday Dynamics in Nullsec uh, so that <coughs> Doomsdays can't target subcap ships. Uh, that might make these uh, strategic cruisers in PvP fittings just become way too difficult to kill. And then I might see a use for the T2 rigs uh, since you're no longer uh, liable to be blown up in one shot from Doomsday. So, you know... I, it might be changing, but uh, I don't think I would ever personally use T2 rigs on a strategic cruiser. Uh, Kolarova asks, if all of your subsystem skills are 1, do you still lose a level? I honestly have no idea. I would assume you do, but uh, I could not say for certain. I'll get back to you on that, Kola. Galt Renan asks, Breku plays Eve? Well, honestly, he plays from Morsus Mihi. I'm not sure I'd call that playing Eve. <laughs> Sorry, I had to... Uh address that one quite uh, personally there. Uh, Bracken and I go way back. He's a good dude. Sarah asks, uh, you know, you said you prefer a Loki for exploration uh, instead of Tengu. May I ask why? Uh, the biggest reason is uh, if you're using uh, the many professions, the hacking and sell, or the, yeah, hacking and, uh, uh, the, what's the other one? I don't remember. Codebreaker. Yeah, Codebreaker. Thank you. If you're using those, uh, you need the mid slots there. With the Tengu, you need those mid slots for your shield tank. But with the Loki, you can armor tank it pretty well, and uh, that'll free up those mid slots for those mini professions. Uh, for PvP, what's the what's the way to go? I've seen many fits with big afterburners. Is that the way to go, or better use the mids for insane shield resistance? For which ship? For the Tango. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not sure I uh, understood your question. You're asking uh, if you're using the Tengu in PvP, would you rather use uh... and the the mid slots? I, I see some fit which use a 100 mega newton afterburner to get away under scrap, I guess. And but most use the mid slots mostly for shield resistance. Yeah. Well, uh, you're going to have one prop mod either way. Uh, with the Tengu, you commonly see that because uh, you don't have to worry about tracking. So you normally just uh, fly way, way far out. Uh, the Tengu can get something like a 110-something kilometer range with missiles. So if you're doing full DPS 100-some-odd kilometers away, and uh, you still go you know, very, very fast, uh, there's one propulsion subsystem. Uh, it's called the Fuel Catalyst. And that gives a huge bonus to afterburner speed. So using that with a 100 mega newton and the heavy missile launcher's huge range and DPS, uh, it's a very very dangerous PVP fit. Uh, I think that's one of the most common PVP fits you'll see with the Tengu is using that 100 mega newton afterburner. Do you have a fit for 100 mega newton afterburner? 
I actually blew one up that was uh, pretty nicely fit, so I'm going to go uh, find that killboard link and I'll post it for you guys. By the way, uh, that's about all I had for the class. If uh, anybody else has questions, feel free to uh, voice them over Mumble or in class, and I will be happy to answer them. Yeah, it looks like uh, that's about it for questions, so thank you guys so much for attending. Uh, I hope you have a lot of good luck with your strategic cruisers. If you guys think of any other questions, feel free to email me. And... Uh, if uh, you guys are interested in carriers at all, um, the last class in my mini marathon here is going to be coming up in about an hour. So stay tuned for that.